When we think of astronomy, we tend to think of something like this, a person studying the position of the stars with a telescope. But from the mid 1800s to the mid 1900s, it looked more like this, studying the image of different frequencies of stars from a photograph made with an image from a telescope and through a diffraction grating or a prism. And now of course we use computers, not photographs, but the basic idea of studying the intensity of different frequencies of light visible or invisible, called spectroscopy, is a backbone of astronomy. But what does that have to do with Joseph Fraunhofer, who was a glassmaker, not an astronomer? How did a glassmaker discover spectroscopy and a diffraction grating? Well, it's a crazy story. Wanna hear it? Ready? Let's go. I would like to start in Munich, Bavaria on a Tuesday, July 21st, 1801. I picked that momentous day because that was when Joseph Fraunhofer was 14 years old and he and his boss's wife were buried in a collapsed building for several hours. Now you might think that was a terrible event for young Joseph and I'm sure it was very traumatic, but it ended up being the event that changed his life for the better. Admittedly, his life up to that point had been pretty horrific. He was the youngest of 11 children born to a poor, overworked glassmaker in the small town of Straubing, Bavaria. And seven of his older brothers and sisters died in childhood from poverty, sickness, and dangerous work conditions. On top of that, his mother died when he was just 10 years old, and his father died the year afterwards, probably poisoned from the toxic fumes from the glasswork. Orphaned and nearly alone, he was indentured for six years to a decorative glassmaker named Philip Weichelberger in faraway Munich. Before his parents died, Fraunhofer rarely went to school because his father needed the help in the glassmaking industry. And after his parents' death, it was even harder. There was a holiday school that would teach workers to read and write on Sundays and late at night. But Wischelberger wouldn't let Fraunhofer go. And even at 14, Joseph Fraunhofer could barely read. Then, as I said before, in 1801, the building that he was in collapsed and he and his master's wife were buried alive. Soon, a large group of volunteers came to rescue them, including the Prince of Bavaria, who came by regularly to encourage the diggers. Mind you, at the time, Munich was a pretty small town, population around 40,000. After four hours of digging, they found young Fraunhofer saved by a crossbeam, whereas his master's wife, whose name has been lost to time and sexism, was crushed to death. Fraunhofer's escape was the talk of the town, and the prince decided that the child was a gift of providence and personally gave the young boy money and asked his privy counselor, Joseph Schneider, to look out for him from then on. Fraunhofer used the money to get out of his indentureship and started an engraving business that went bust less than six months later. Soon, poor Fraunhofer found himself back working for Wilsterberger and miserable. Meanwhile, in 1804, the privy counselor, Uschneider, left politics and started a mechanical institute with a friend. And in 1806, Uschneider took pity on Fraunhofer and hired him as an assistant to the institute where he impressed everyone. At about the same time, Uschneider hired a glassmaker named Pierre Gounand to make quality lenses for their telescopes. Within a year, Gounand asked for a large raise and Uschneider agreed, but with the stipulation that Gounard had to teach all of his secrets to 20-year-old Fraunhofer. This partnership did not last long. Fraunhofer and Gennad guess just didn't get along. And by 1809, Uschneider decided that his protege was the far superior glassmaker and actually paid Gwynand to just go away and not make glass anymore and promoted Fraunhofer at just 22 years old to be the director of the glassworks and the junior partner of the Optical Institute of Uschneider, Rackenbach, and Fraunhofer. By 1811, Fraunhofer had 48 employees, and by 1820, he was made the director of the institute. Meanwhile, Fraunhofer was constantly searching for ways to improve the quality and precision of his glass. That is why in 1814 or so, 27-year-old Fraunhofer started looking for a way to find single colors so he could study precisely how much they refracted or bent when they went through a glass. 
or as he put it, it would be most advantageous if one could measure for every kind of glass the dispersion for every color, but the different colors in the spectrums have no definite limit. Fraunhofer had noticed a bright yellow-red spot from a lamp when he viewed it through a prism and decided to see if the sunlight had the same bright mark that was diffracted in the same way. He therefore shined sunlight through a small opening to get a beam and then through one of his prisms and examined the light on the screen. However, instead of a bright spot at the yellow-red, instead he saw dark lines. Shocked, he looked through the light through a telescope and as he put it, quote, I saw with the telescope an almost countless number of strong and weak vertical lines. Now Fraunhofer wasn't the first person to see shadows in the sunlight. Twelve years before, in 1802, an English scientist named William Hyde Wollaston spent a long time determining the refractive index of different materials by using a prism. In this paper, Wollaston noticed five dark lines and two faint lines in sunlight but he only thought they were bands distinguishing four colors of red, yellowish green, blue, and violet. Unlike Wollaston, however, Fraunhofer, with the aid of his telescope, realized that the lines had nothing to do with the color, remarking, quote, the strongest lines do not in any way mark the limit of various colors. There's almost always the same color on both sides of the line, and the passage from one color into another cannot be noted. Fraunhofer labeled the thicker lines with capital letters and counted over 540 lines in a ridiculously detailed chart, and his labels are still used today. Fraunhofer wondered if these dark lines were inherent in the sunlight or if they were some trick of the experiment, from like the shape or the size of the opening. So after several experiments, he came upon the idea of looking at the spectrum from Venus as he could examine it without making the light pass through a small opening. He then found, quote, the same lines as those which appear in sunlight, with the caveat that some of the lines were hard to see with the dim light from Venus. He then turned his telescope to study some of the stars and found to his surprise that they weren't all the same. For example, the star Sirius had, quote, three broad bands which appear to have no connection with those of sunlight, and the various stars seemed to differ among themselves. Thus, it seemed pretty conclusive that these dark bands had something to do with the sunlight or the starlight itself and therefore could tell you something about the sun or the stars. Or as he put it, he was, quote, convinced that these lines and bands are due to the nature of sunlight. He then went back to his lamplight and studied it again, now with a prism and a telescope, and found that the reddish-yellow bright line in the spectrum consists of two very fine bright lines, which in intensity and distance apart, or like the two dark lines, D. Fraunhofer didn't know that the bright lines from his lamp were from burning sodium, and the dark lines in the sunlight were from the sodium on the atmosphere of the sun absorbing those same frequencies. Now Fraunhofer was very busy and didn't publish anything significant again for seven more years, till 1823. When he had been experimenting with thin beams of light, he noticed that before he added the prism, the image of his beam of light on the screen had colored edges. Fraunhofer was intrigued by the colored lights at the edges, as it reminded him of the rainbow of light you could get from a prism, and decided to investigate further. He therefore started with light going through a small opening that he could change with a screw, and observed the results on the screen with a telescope. He found there were many dim rainbows on the side of the central beam of diminishing intensity. He also found the position of this mini rainbow was a constant divided by the width of the opening. This, by the way, is why single slit diffraction is often called Fraunhofer single slit diffraction. Fraunhofer became irritated by how difficult his experiment was to do because with light going through a tiny slit, the image he was looking at was so very dim. He therefore had the idea of using multiple slits in a row or a grating. He then had an ingenious idea of how to make a grating. He wound thick wire between two screws that were only slightly wider than the wire. So he ended up with 260 parallel wires that were 20 milli inches thick and only 3.8 milli inches apart. When he conducted the experiment, Instead of looking like a single slit only brighter, he found a whole new result, writing, 
Quote, I was most surprised to observe the phenomena seen through the telescope when the grating was used was entirely different from those observed by diffraction through a single opening. He then found that the first peak looked, quote, exactly like those seen through a good prism, and even recreated his Fraunhofer lines with his grating. Joseph Fraunhofer was appointed a royal professor and knighted in 1824. Tragically, less than three years after publishing his work on gratings, he fell ill from working with glass with heavy metals in it, the same thing that killed his father and died when he was just 39 years old. At his funeral, his former mentor, Joseph Uschneider, added an epitaph, Approximivit Sidera, which loosely translates to, he brought the stars closer. Now, Uschneider meant that Fraunhofer brought the stars closer with his amazing glasswork and his amazing telescopes, which you can still purchase if you have the cash. But it turned out that his work with the shadows and the sunlight and the bright lights from his lamp would bring the stars closer still, for they were the clue to solving an ancient mystery, which is, what are the stars composed of? And how we know what the stars are composed of is next time on The Lightning Tamers. Thank you for watching my video. Big thank you to my Patreons. If you want to join their ranks, there's a link down below. Please remember to put a comment, subscribe, hit the bell button, share it on social media, hit buttons until you're sick of it. Stay safe out there. Bye. Only video I've done so far where a scientist was saved by a prince. And don't wait for princes. They're not all that nice. <laughs> I've been watching The Crown. That's a bad idea. Don't talk about princes when you watch The Crown. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> all right. Too silly. <clears throat>